So now we get to perhaps the cardinal guideline in all of organic chemistry, and one that I believe in so much that I have decided to call it a rule. And that is that when you're looking at an organic chemistry problem, the best way to approach it is to look at the most charged species and realize that that is going to react first. And this is almost always true with any organic chemistry question that you encounter. If you can find the most charged species, that will react first. And it reacts with the most strongly charged species of the opposite type. So if you have something with a formal negative charge, it will find some positive charge or perhaps a po partial positive charge somewhere in its environment and it will attack that directly. And that's the number one way to approach organic chemistry questions, and that will guide you very well. So the most charged species reacts first, and it reacts with the most strongly charged species of the opposite type. Now, on the MCAT, there are only three main exceptions that you will encounter to this rule. Be aware of these exceptions because they do come up a lot. But if you have these three in mind and you recognize them when they show up, then you'll be able to apply this rule and solve the vast majority of OCHEM questions that you encounter. So the first exception deals with what we call spectator ions. And a spectator ion is an ion that sits on the sidelines. That's why they call it a spectator. And these ions are the cations of your elements in column one and two of the periodic table. So you're looking at stuff like Na+, K+, Li+, calcium cation, magnesium cation. These are also recognizable because they're the conjugate acids of the strong bases. So if, for example, if you have NaOH or KOH or something like that, these are the conjugate acids of those. And it kind of makes sense. If a strong base is something that dissociates and grabs protons really well, then that means that its conjugate acid shouldn't be very reactive. And so in an organic chemistry environment, if you have one of these sodium ions or potassium ions, a lot of times you can assume that that will not interact with the carbon around because remember, carbon is often partial positive and these things are very comfortable being positively charged. They complete their octet that way. So these things will not be inclined to interact with carbon because both of them are positive and these are very stable while carrying a positive charge. These are often used in organic chemistry to deliver negatively charged or perhaps partially negative species. And then they sit on the sidelines, don't do much while the reaction goes on. And then perhaps in the last step, they may rejoin with something in the form of a salt. But oftentimes when you see unusual looking species in organic chemistry, perhaps something like NaCN, the best thing to think is, well there, I see sodium. That is one of those spectator ions. And when that's in an ionic bond, like it is here, NaCN, the purpose of this sodium cyanide, its purpose is to deliver the Cn minus ion to the environment. And so the sodium just serves to deliver that Cn minus, and then the Cn minus cyanide ion can attack any, any strongly positively charged thing that it sees. And this is a very, very useful and productive substrate in organic chemistry. But the key is recognizing that when you see something unusual like NaCN, perhaps something you haven't encountered before, or maybe you see something like KOCH3, realize that that Na in NaCN is there just to deliver the Cn minus. And if you have something like KOCH3, what the potassium is really there for is so that it can dissociate and that will yield a negatively charged ion of CH3O minus or a negatively charged methane ion. And so whenever you see a spectator ion, be aware that these are often just salts that are being used to deliver a negatively charged thing. And then the sodium, the potassium, the lithium will sit on the sidelines. And even though it is very charged, it's formally charged with either a plus one or in the case of calcium, with a plus two, even though it has that formal positive charge, it will not be too inclined to interact with other things within its OCHEM environment. 
So we move now from spectator ions, which are the conjugate acids of strong bases usually, to the opposite, which is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So these are species like Cl minus, Br minus, HSO4 minus, the conjugate bases of the very strong acids. Now remember that a strong acid is defined as something that dissociates and provides a proton and its conjugate base is not inclined to pick up that proton despite being very negatively charged. All of these have a formal negative charge, yet a lot of times the purpose of a strong acid is to deliver an H plus to its environment and that is the predominant use of many things, for example an H2SO4. In organic chemistry you'll see that as a way of yielding an acidic environment and the conjugate base of that will be negatively charged, but it might not be very reactive. Now, realize that there will be a few occasions where something like a Cl- or a Br- might react. And the reason for that is that organic chemistry, a lot of times, is the chemistry of positively charged carbon. And so if you have negatively charged species, perhaps a nucleophile or various other agents there, then a negatively charged species can be relevant in organic chemistry. It's because negatively charged things are attracted to positive charges and carbon is often positively charged. So a Cl- or a Br- may react, but it's just as likely that it can sit on the sidelines and its only job is to provide protons to create an acidic environment for other things to happen. So this is our second exception to the rule that the most charged species reacts first. We have the spectator ions, which are the conjugate acids of the strong bases, things like Na+, K+, Li+, and calcium and magnesium ions. We also have the conjugate base of strong acids, things like Cl-, Br-, and particularly HSO4-. These are all examples of charged species that may not be the most immediately relevant species in your organic environment. And then our third exception, which is another one that you can encounter on the MCAT, is a diprotic amino acid. Remember that amino acids can exist in multiple forms. And when it's diprotic, that means that its amino group has an extra proton. It has three protons on that nitrogen, and so that N is positively charged. And the carboxylic acid group has its proton as well. Now, according to this rule that the most charged species will react first, it seems like the positively charged nitrogen would be more likely to give up a proton than this carboxylic acid COOH group. But what actually happens, and this is something that has been experimentally proven consistently, is that the carboxylic acid is actually more acidic. And so it gives up its proton going negative before the thing that carries the formal charge will give up its own. When it does this, it forms what's called a zwitter ion. A zwitter ion is something with a positive and negative charge within the same species. And this isn't all that organically relevant. A lot of times you won't encounter this in problems. But if you see it, recognize that just because this amino group is positively charged, that doesn't make it the most acidic within this amino acid. And so the amino acid instead will be giving up the proton from its carboxylic acid group. And those are the three major exceptions that you'll encounter on the MCAT. Those are the main ones that I've found where you can't assume that the most charged species will react first. So even though Na+, K+, Ca2+, even though these are all very charged, they aren't necessarily going to be reactive and they're not likely to react in a carbon-based environment. So those can sit on the sidelines as spectator ions. Your conjugate bases of strong acids are similar. Their job, the strong acid, is to deliver a proton and not to have a very reactive Cl- or Br-, although at times it can, and we'll get into some examples of those later on when we discuss halogenation. And the diprotic amino acid, when you see this, just recognize that it's actually the carboxylic acid that donates its proton rather than the other way around. And so if you can ingrain these three main exceptions into your mind, then it's very safe to say that it will often guide you in the right direction 
if you look for the most strongly charged species and realize that that is most likely to react first. And what it will react with is the most strongly charged species of the opposite type. So if you have something that's a very strongly negative charged thing, it will look for a positively charged species somewhere else in its environment. Unless it's in the situation with a strong base dissociating or a conjugate base of a strong acid being dissociated. Other than that, look for the most charged species and that is the thing that will react. And now, once that happens, perhaps that might require a bond to be broken. And we'll go through the rules for breaking bonds soon and that will really simplify a lot of the discussion of organic chemistry. Mm -hmm.